and welcome back to the 8-Bit Guy. So um, over the years, I've received many emails from people who um, they found a computer at like a thrift store or in a garage sale, or maybe they just saw it in a TV show or a movie. And so they're emailing me to ask me what I can tell them about it. And so um, I reply to them that, oh, well, that's not actually a computer. It's a terminal. And the reply that most commonly follows after that is, what's the difference? And while I'm pretty sure most of my audience actually knows what a terminal is, uh, I thought I would just go ahead and make this video to explain it to the rest of the world that does not. In the early days of computers, believe it or not, they didn't have screens as we think of it. In fact, the really early computers only had a series of switches and indicator lights. But as computers became more sophisticated, they needed ways for the computer to communicate back to us humans in something a little easier to read. You may have seen teletypes being used in movies depicting rooms full of women typing messages back and forth with distant places. Uh, for example, these are from the movie Valkyrie. Now, these were essentially the next evolution of the telegraph. Instead of tapping out messages in Morse code, you could type on a machine that works very much like a typewriter, only your message could appear on another such machine on the other side of the country. So these machines were not invented specifically to use with computers, but were rather adapted to work with computers as it was a natural synergy of these two products. For decades, people used teletypes to type commands to a computer, and the computer would return the output by printing to paper. These teletype machines could be in the same room with the computer or in another part of the building or could even use a modem to connect to the computer off-site. Some computers were single-user systems that would have a single teletype, whereas larger computers could be multi-user and thus have multiple teletypes connected. Now what's interesting is if you watch the original Star Trek from 1966, at no point will you ever see computer text displayed on a screen. And what's more telling is that when the Enterprise computer speaks, you can hear the distinct sound of a teletype in the background. Incorrect. You can't really blame the writers because, I mean, that was simply the paradigm by which people understood computers at that time. In fact, I, you know, I've looked at a bunch of movies from the 1950s and the 1960s, and I haven't found a single one that depicts a computer displaying like digital text on a screen, except for maybe 2001 Space Odyssey, which does sort of depict that kind of thing. Ironically, science fact may have been a little bit ahead of science fiction because NASA did in fact have computer screens in mission control during the late 1960s with the Apollo program. So you have to really stop and consider how advanced this sort of thing was for the time. But back to teletypes. There were a few downsides to printing everything to paper though. Uh, one obvious problem is that you go through a lot of ink and paper, which can get messy and expensive. Another problem is that these machines are pretty noisy, especially if you have a room full of them. And since they are mechanical, they probably require regular maintenance. And so at some point, somebody must have had the bright idea to say, hey, you know, instead of printing all this stuff out on paper, maybe we could just display it on something like a television screen. A few years ago, I traveled to the birthplace of the glass teletype, which was invented by Datapoint Corporation in San Antonio, Texas. And this product was known as the Datapoint 3300, which began development around 1967 and first started shipping to customers in 1969. The idea would be that it would receive serial data and print the characters to a screen, usually at the bottom. And then as more data comes in, the information would scroll up the screen and eventually disappear. So there would be no permanent record of what was printed, like a teletype. But that wasn't always a requirement. The important distinction here is that these are not computers, nor are they computer monitors. Terminals do not display a video signal as such. Instead, they're receiving one text character at a time, transmitted as ASCII code over a serial data connection, exactly like a teletype was designed to work. In order to learn more about terminals, I decided to take a little road trip for this episode. So I'm taking a little drive out in kind of the middle of nowhere uh, to visit another YouTuber. Uh, his name is David Lovett, and uh, he runs the YouTube channel Usagi Electric. He's got some stuff that I think will fit in very well with what we're talking about. If you aren't familiar with David Lovett, he recently guest starred in an episode of Veritasium showing off some vacuum tube computers. He also lives in Texas, but lives in a rural area called Heiko. I had to drive seemingly forever through the middle of nowhere. I drove past this land full of grazing dinosaurs just north of Glen Rose, Texas. I kid you not. When I finally turned into his driveway, I wasn't quite sure if I was in the right place. I mean, uh, there were wild deer walking around. 
Um, then I drove by some cows. <laughs> the driveway just went on and on, but uh, finally I arrived in an actual house. And I hope you like the Smurfy wrap I did on my car and wheels. <laughs> anyway, here's David Lovett, and uh, he took me out to his workshop. I'm sort of jealous how much space he has in here. Puts my little workshop to shame. He has some uh, little Japanese cars out here. Um, I especially liked the little Honda Beat. It's a uh, Japanese K car. Um, it has a tiny engine, so it's probably not very fast. This thing's like driving a go-kart. <laughs> but it is so cool. I drive this around. Yeah. Oh my gosh, but it is hard to get out. <laughs> So, on to business. Uh, one thing I noticed right away is that he had some old teletypes here. This one is from 1924, we think. Uh, and this one's going to be probably late 20s, maybe early 30s, 29, 1930, something like that. So, uh, this one's almost 100 years old. Um, but that was how to send data electrically. So, the, the, what it is missing is uh, ticker tape. I don't know where you find one character wide ticker tape. Uh, and so also I need a new ribbon for it. So this one doesn't receive at the moment, but it will send. The send mechanism is down here. So if we plug it in, we can type and send data out. Uh, since it's a teletype, it's all 5-bit Bado. Uh, this one is also 5-bit Bado. Eventually we'll get the Model 14 and the Model 15 on the same current loop, and they will talk to each other. So if I push the letter G here, it will type the letter G here. If I push the letter F here, it will type the letter F here. That's the hope. I was also very impressed with this large vacuum tube computer from the 1950s called the Bendix computer. And uh, while transistors weren't available yet, uh, thus the need for vacuum tubes, geranium diodes were available, which did help to shrink the size of this thing down to what it is. Yeah, so this is, this is the rotating drum, so there's 8K of memory in there. Uh, and then all of the logic, so this is pretty much the heart of the computer right here, the backside. So each one of these vertical slots you see is what one of those cards plugs into. And those cards are really simple. They just have like a flip-flop or a buffer or an inverter on them, just building blocks. And then you connect the building blocks together with this wiring to create unique complex logic. David has an ADM3A terminal. Uh, this is a very iconic terminal that came out in the late 1970s, although apparently they are still in use by the Time Variance Authority in the Marvel TV series Loki. Unfortunately, David's specimen is suffering from something called cataracts, where a protective film on the CRT starts to form bubbles. Now, if you take a look inside the terminal, uh, what you'll find is a bunch of TTL logic chips. There's no microprocessor in this thing. So one side note, when I was talking to David Lovett, uh, one of the questions I posed to him, since he knows a lot about this kind of stuff, is, uh, says, you know, if somebody had thought about the idea of a terminal, like using a screen instead of, you know, a teletype, uh, back in like the 1950s, could it have been built out of vacuum tubes? And uh, the answer we both came up with after discussing the technology well is yes, it absolutely could have been done with vacuum tubes. Um, <laughs> probably the most challenging part of it would have been dealing with the uh, ROM that would hold the character set information and the RAM to hold the screen buffer. I mean, both of those things could be done, but they were uh, that would have been probably the, the, the most costly part of it. Oh, and I'm sure it would have been pretty big. <laughs> David showed me another one of his prized possessions, the Centurion. Uh, it's a mini computer designed in the 1970s, and uh, it's a multi-user computer designed to handle up to 32 terminals connected at once. And while the terminal itself is branded as Centurion, it's actually just a rebranded Ads Regent 100, as I'm sure you can see the similarity. Uh, so one thing that's immediately obvious looking at this terminal is that it isn't quite as dumb as some terminals. <laughs> now, while these terminals were often called dumb terminals because they didn't have a CPU and couldn't execute code, some terminals were smarter than others. Um, the original terminals could only print text at the bottom and have the text scroll up the screen, exactly the way a teletype was intended to work. However, later terminals introduced certain byte sequences that could instruct the terminal to clear the screen uh, or reposition the cursor. Now, this allows for much more interactive programs that can move text around on the screen. 
So when I try to explain to people what a dumb terminal is, a lot of people will come to the conclusion that it is essentially the same thing as putting a keyboard and a monitor in the same case and calling it a terminal. Now, this is a very crude and somewhat inaccurate explanation. For example, this digital VT320 that David had in his shop uses an external keyboard. The keyboard, however, is not connected to the computer, rather to the terminal. But another interesting distinction is this. Pretty much any computer that uses a monitor, whether that monitor is a television, a CRT, uh, or even a flat screen, uh, there's a universal truth. That is, if you unplug the monitor from the computer, the monitor goes blank. However, let's perform that same experiment with a terminal. So that's all of the junk on our hard drive. And then, this is the data cable coming from the computer. So if I unhook that data cable, see all the data still there. Because the dumb terminal has its own internal memory that stores whatever's stored on the screen. I can type, but it doesn't go anywhere. The terminal right now is currently completely unplugged from the computer. So if I type on the keyboard, you can see nothing shows up here. Uh, and that's because the terminal is trying to send ASCII data to the computer. So every time I hit a button, it's trying to send 8 bits of data out to the computer. And the computer has to echo that back to the terminal so I can see it displayed down here. But because the connection between the two has been severed, Nothing gets sent, nothing gets sent back to the terminal to echo, but all of our data is still sitting within the terminal's own memory. If you think about it, this is the same behavior from a teletype, because the text printed to the paper would still be on the paper, even if the teletype were unplugged from the computer. But if I lean on the back here and I plug it right back in, we're picking up right where we left off. There's another DIR, boom, like nothing ever happened. Most terminals were used in environments where there was a large central computer, such as a mainframe or mini computer. You can see them in people's offices in the movie War Games, for example. But some types of personal computers, even those made in the 1970s and early 80s, were also designed to use a single dumb terminal. Most machines that use CPM were designed around a terminal for a display. In fact, back to our movie War Games again for a moment, you'll see the computer used by David is a CPM based computer and what he's typing on and looking at is actually a dumb terminal. Some personal computers actually essentially integrated a dumb terminal internally. Uh, this was quite common with computers like the Osborne and the K-Pro because it was necessary to maintain compatibility with the operating system and how it expected to work. Another interesting example is the Apple One. It has a relatively primitive dumb terminal built right into it. And you can actually more or less divide the board into the bottom half, which is the computer, and the top half, which is the terminal. The downside to any computer using a terminal as a display is that the vast majority of terminals were limited to monochrome text only, and most of the early terminals couldn't even reposition the cursor or clear the screen. As you might imagine, there weren't a lot of games written to use these as they were primarily meant for business use. However, there were some terminals that could display color text, and even some that could display color graphics. These were pretty rare and were still meant primarily for business use as they'd be far too slow to be able to update the screen quickly for games. I did use my fair share of terminals, however. Uh, this photo here is me around the age of 19 working at Mauser Electronics. And that's my terminal there next to me. But even before then, I used terminals on my Commodore computers. But in this case, it's not a dumb terminal, rather a terminal emulator, uh, which is basically a piece of software designed to make your computer behave like a terminal. And uh, we use these programs to call bulletin board systems of the time. And still to this day, on Windows, Mac, and Linux, you'll find a program called Terminal. And it's so named because it essentially does the function of what a dumb terminal used to do, which is give you a window into your operating system. As such, the terminal lives on as a virtual thing these days. And that's it for this episode. So as always, thanks for watching.